Let's talk about convergent margins. In addition to convergent margins, we'll discuss issues related to continental growth and dis destruction. And the topics will include the main site for continental formation and destruction, um, naked versus sedimented forearcs, uplift versus subsidence, and whether we have subduction zone underplating of the continental margin or subduction erosion, relamination, art growth, the andesite paradox, and delamination, and finally the earthquake cycle and accretionary prism thrusting. The focus in the subduction zones lecture was on the downgoing plate and the focus in this lecture will be on the response of the overriding plate and on continental growth and destruction. Convergent margin is essentially the overriding plate of a subduction zone. Let's look at the parts of the subduction zone again and start with the downgoing oceanic crust. Recall that we have the outer trench high that is a flexural response to the bending of that downgoing plate. We have the, the forearc, which comprises the forearc basin, as well as the accretionary prism. We have the magmatic arc. We have the back arc basin, where extension is taking place behind the magmatic arc. And the downgoing uh, lithosphere is also taking with it oceanic crust. And we are getting dehydration reactions while that downgoing lithosphere is being metamorphosed at higher pressure and low temperature metamorphic conditions. And those fluids are entering the overriding mantle wedge. Recall too that these fluids that are being driven off of the downgoing oceanic plate, they're entering the mantle wedge and that lowers the melting temperature of that mantle peridotite. And so we get partial melts of the mantle generating basalts. We also have this nose of hot mantle lithosphere coming up into the mantle wedge and that is subjected to uh, decompression melting as well. Those fluids are also serpentinizing the mantle that is in the mantle wedge above that downgoing plate. We can look at what might be an archetypal convergent margin, that is what we have in California. And this map is essentially, this is the Pacific out here, and this represents the Sierra Nevada. And so this cross section is, is going from west to east across California. What we see is the Franciscan subduction complex in the accretionary prism. And that consists of sediments and oceanic crust and pieces of mantle that are uh, scraped off of the downgoing plate or that are exhumed within uh, the subduction zone. We have the, the Great Valley, which is the forearc basin with kilometers of sediment. We have the Sierra Nevada, that is the magmatic arc. 
And we can go, as we go through this lecture, um, we can think about whether this is a typical or an atypical uh, convergent margin. So on the map, the pale green rocks along the coast are the, the forearc accretionary prism rocks. The yellow rocks, or the yellow map unit in the center of California, in our central valley, rep are the um, Great Valley sequence fork basin sediments. And the red rocks are the magmatic arc that's now exposed. And in purple, we have ultramafic rocks that are serpentinites coming up along the western edge of the Great Valley sequence. We also have some of those ultramafic rocks that have been exhumed within the accretionary prism as part of the Franciscan complex. Let's look at the Mariana system. These next several diagrams will have a map view of the Mariana system and the arrow pointing to the region or the box surrounding the region that we're discussing below. And we'll have these 3D cross sections of this convergent margin. In the Mariana, we have the arc itself. We have the subducting Pacific plate and the trench that results. And so you have the, the high outboard of the trench and then the Pacific plate diving down beneath the magmatic arc. We have the back arc basin behind the main arc, the active arc. We have the ridge behind the back arc basin that is a remnant of the Mariana arc and represents an older history of that convergent margin system. And of course, we have the fore arc in front of the active arc. So we can look at the subducting Pacific plate and see again that it is in tension. We see the evidence of bending of that plate in normal faults that appear in the seismic cross-section. And notice too the seamounts that are being carried along the plate that will eventually be subducted. In the Mariana system, this is some of the oldest oceanic lithosphere that's being subducted. And so old, cold lithosphere is going to subduct easily. And that subduction angle is going to be steep and nearly vertical beneath the volcanic arc. This system is a type location for trench rollback, which means that over the history of the subduction zone, the trench moves outward from the arc to a steeper subduction angle over time. The trench is moving east here, and that explains the extension that we see in the fore arc and the back arc. The southwest-northeast lineation that we're seeing uh, on the seafloor are the normal faults that are created as the plate is bending 
as it gets closer to the trench. Notice too, this is an example from the Woodlark Basin in Papua New Guinea. We can see seamounts entering the trench and later we'll look at how that affects uh, the convergent margin. Now let's look at the forearc. We see the trench again here, a seamount that is just entering the trench. We see serpentinite mud volcanoes erupting from the fluids that are interacting with the mantle. These fluids are rising from the subducting slab and serpentinizing that mantle wedge. The resultant rock is much lower in density and rises to the surface along normal faults that you see here. More forearc, we can look at the uh, seismic cross-section here and see rotated fault blocks that are created as the forearc is in extension. So normal fault blocks here, rotating back. And recall that the forearc extension is a result of the slab retreat that's taking place. Now let's look at the arc. This is the, the, the active arc. Here is Pagan Volcano and an image of that volcano erupting. Not all of the volcanoes are above the sea level. And in general, it's characterized by fairly evenly spaced volcanoes. One potential hazard in the arc are landslides and a large slide package like this that is over 450 cubic kilometers in size. That's large enough to potentially cause a tsunami. Now let's look at the back arc. Here we've got the, the active arc and the back arc basin here and the remnant arc that split away from the main arc when the back arc basin opened. The spreading center is over here. And we can see on seismic cross section a lens of magma beneath that spreading center. A combination of bathymetry and seismic reflection data allows us to see under the sediments and image the underlying oceanic lithosphere and extended arc crust. Here we see the arc with the arc highs. We see normal faults that are helping to extend the back arc basin and the spreading axis. Keep in mind that not all arcs have a textbook convex outward appearance like the Tonga Kermadec arc. Not all arcs consist of islands, so you can think of Cascadia or the Andes. Arcs are broad, about 200 kilometer wide crustal tracks. Arcs typically persist for several tens up to hundreds of millions of years, while the volcanoes only persist for several million years. This next set of rather gaudy slides come from Dave Schall, who's cited in, in many of them, and he's developed this idea of the importance of subduction erosion that we'll talk about. 
the estimated global continental crustal additions from the mantle and losses to the mantle are similar. The total crustal additions are about three cubic kilometers per year. And those come from hotspot volcanism, uh, volcanism in rifts, and arc magmatism. While the total crustal losses are about also, while the total crustal losses are about three cubic kilometers per year, and those come from the subduction of sediments from the erosion of the overriding plate in the subduction zone and from delamination of the crust by a number of possible different processes but when that lower crust is uh, mafic and dense and can sink into the mantle. Back arc basins are extensional basins that formed as a result of seafloor spreading behind an island arc. And interarc basins are zones of rifting associated with arcs that have not progressed to the point of seafloor spreading. And both can be active or extinct. Let's compare marginal basins to back arc basins and interarc basins. Marginal basins are any distinct basin along the margins of continents or oceans, but there's no genetic connotation. For example, the Aleutian Basin and the Cayman Trough and Caribbean Sea are not back arc basins. The Mariana type subduction zones are under extension. We have old, thick, cold, dense lithosphere subducting at a very steep angle beneath the arc. And that also gives us back arc extension. Active back arc basins are shown here in red. And those include the Mariana Trough that we've been talking about, the Lao Back Arc Basin in the Tonga Kermadec system, the Andaman Sea in Indonesia, the Okinawa Trough, the Scotia Sea Basin, the Tyrrhenian Sea. and the Fijian and Manus basins in the Southwest Pacific. Actively extending back arc basins and interarc basins are volcanically active and have high heat flow. Extinct back arc basins and interarc basins have normal heat flow. This figure shows us active back arc basins and interarc basins with high heat flow. So the Lao Basin, the Mariana Trough, the Shikoko Bunin Trough, and the inactive back arc basins with normal heat flow are often behind these basins. Remember back arc basins formed by seafloor spreading and we can look at the seismic velocity profile in this diagram to see that velocities are lower at depths between about 40 and 100 kilometers where melts are produced. This structure is similar to mid-ocean ridges 
and notice that there are significant variations between the, the Lao Basin and the Mariana Basin. What causes back arc basins? Here are a couple of kinematic models. Um, in one case, in the Lao Basin situation, we have trench rollback. So the subducting slab is rolling back and starting to subduct more steeply. In the Mariana Trough, we have retreat of the back arc plate. Here we see the Izu Bonin Mariana system. We have the Mariana Trench here. The Mariana Trough is the active back arc basin to that subduction system. And we have the Parese Vela Shikoku troughs that are extinct. The Palang Kyushu Ridge is part of the remnant arc behind the Parese Vela Basin and the West Mariana Ridge is the remnant arc behind the Mariana Trough. The active arc is here nearest to the trench. So the history of the system begins about 40 million years ago with the first unrifted arc. We had subduction beneath a single volcanic arc. This generated the Shikoko Parese Vela back arc basin and the Palau Kyushu Ridge that is the remnant arc from that system. We have a second arc developing with a new subduction system about 15 million years ago and the Mariana Trough opens up and leaves the West Mariana Ridge starting about 7 million years ago. The Mariana Trough is about 1,400 kilometers long. It's about as long as California. And here I've marked the Mariana Trench, the active arc, the Mariana Trough, the back arc basin behind the arc, and the West Mariana Ridge, that remnant arc that separated from the main arc when the back arc basin opened. Here's the central Mariana Trough. Extension has been going on for about 7 million years. Seafloor spreading occurs here, and the morphology of the ridge axis looks like a slow spreading ridge and the volcanic arc is mature. If we look at a velocity profile of the Mariana system, we can look at this simplified cartoon below that shows a high velocity lower crust next to some lower velocity, lower crust that's adjacent to the Mariana Trough. That's probably due to a mixture of crystallized basaltic magmas and transformed crustal materials and melts.
The low velocity root is probably due to serpentinization or rising melts. And we see that we have a relatively high velocity middle crust. A basic architecture of an arc trench system looks like this with down going oceanic lithosphere. The trench that might be full of sediments or empty. There may or may not be an accretionary prism. We may have a sedimented forearc basin, or it may be, or there may be very little sedimentation. We have the magmatic arc. And typically the distance between the trench and the arc is about 200 kilometers. We have the mantle wedge above the downgoing oceanic lithosphere and beneath the continental margin. And we have the back arc that may be extensional or compressional. What are the most important controls on convergent margin deformation? We have to consider the thickness that corresponds to the buoyancy of subducting crust. Thin crust is easily subducted. Thick crust impedes subduction, deforms the forearc, and may stop subduction. This is also known as a collision or suturing or a terrain accretion. The age of the subducting lithosphere also corresponds to the buoyancy of the lithosphere. Old lithosphere, more than about 40 million years, is denser than the underlying acenosphere and subducts easily. Young lithosphere that is less than about 40 million years is less dense than the acenosphere and resists subduction. We'll also consider the obliquity of convergence, where strain is partitioned between dip parallel and a long strike faulting, and sediment thickness. Thick sediments, more than about uh, a kilometer thick on the downgoing plate, are largely scraped off to form an accretionary prism between the trench and the forearc. A thin layer of sediments results in tectonic erosion of the forearc. First, we'll consider the thickness and age of subducting lithosphere. This diagram looks at only the cooling effect on densification of lithosphere and not phase changes. And we see three situations where we have a gravitationally unstable lithosphere where the density of the lithosphere is greater than the acenosphere in older lithosphere, 100 million year lithosphere. We have, on the other end, buoyant lithosphere that is young. This is brand new lithosphere, where the density of the lithosphere is less than the acenosphere, and it's very thin. And notice that the old, thick lithosphere has the highest densities of these three packages of lithosphere and should readily subduct. We look at the oceanic plate age on the x-axis here and the density on the y-axis. We can see the curve for the density increase as the crust becomes older and colder. Next, we'll consider the obliquity of convergence. Convergent margins where relative plate motion is not perpendicular to the trench can have strain partition between trench normal contraction and forearc strike slip shearing. So whether we have trench normal contraction or trench parallel strike slip motion.
Here the downgoing plate is entering the trench at a moderate angle to generate this component of right lateral strike slip motion. An example of this is the Sumatran fault. Margin parallel strike slip faults are frequently found inboard of strongly oblique convergent margins. In this system, the subducting Indian Ocean is coming in at an angle compared to the trench. Margin parallel shear is localized landward of the strongest contractional strain, often within the volcanic line. And here, the Sumatran fault develops a dextral sense of motion and slips about 25 millimeters a year. Next, let's consider sediment thickness. In accretionary convergent margins, we have a subduction zone that's bringing in a lot of sediment, and that builds the accretionary prism, and we develop a thick forearc basin. And this is up against a backstop of crystalline arc rocks. In a non-accretionary or naked convergent margin, these are erosive, uh, as are some of the sedimented forearcs. We have an empty trench, exposed basement, a thin forearc basin, the mantle wedge coming up to shallow levels above the subducting slab, and serpentinite mud volcanoes. So in the case of California, if we go back to that example, we have a sediment-rich system with a deep forearc basin and an accretionary prism full of sediments and oceanic lithospheric rocks. So in accretionary margins, like Cascadia, these are characterized by thrusted and penetratively deformed trenches and oceanic sediments that often develop mud diapirism and volcanism because of sediment overpressuring. Gas hydrate zones are also common. In the case of an erosive or a non-accretionary convergent margin, like the Izu Bonin Mariana margin and the Tonga Kermadec system, these have steep trench slopes composed of volcanic, plutonic, and mantle rocks, part of the arc infrastructure, and the four arc tectonics is dominated by serpentinite tectonics. This map shows the distribution of accretionary and non accretionary four arcs. It's missing two, it's missing the Macron and Aegean margins that are both accreting margins. You'll see that this represents 21,000 kilometers of non-accretionary margin in red, including the Peru-Chile trench, the Aleutian Arc, Kamchatka, the Zubon and Mariana system, and the tonga Kermadec system. and 25,000 kilometers of accretionary margins, including the Sumatra Andaman system, southern Chile, Cascadia, the Nankai Trough. Non-accreting margins are about 75% of all major subduction zones, and this diagram shows two different aspects of the system, the major rock and sediment masses, and the major recycling processes. We'll look at the major rock and sediment masses first. We see the ocean floor sediment that's entering the subduction zone, a small accretionary prism, a thin sedimentary apron. On the lower diagram, we see a narrowing distance between the trench and the back of the forearc. And in 
a subduction erosion setting, we see subduction of the sediments on the downgoing plate, as well as debris shed from the inner trench slope. And we see erosion of pieces of the overriding plate. In an accreting margin that comprises about 25% of all major subduction zones, we see a wide body of accreted material consisting of little deforming older accreted prism and the base of the slope, the frontal prism of actively deforming or shortening sediment that's scraped off the subducting lower plate. And the forearc widens over time as the trench retreats seaward with far less material being subducted down the trench. Three tectonic processes govern the transport of material toward the mantle. First is the formation of this frontal prism. Second is the subduction of sediment. And third is subduction erosion. The evidence that we have for sediment subduction, and we can use Northeast Japan as an example, at most, or about 80% of convergent margins, the frontal prism represents only a fraction of the ocean floor sediment that's carried into the subduction zone. In Northeast Japan, since the late Cretaceous, more than 95% of incoming sediment bypassed the prism and was subducted landward of the backstop. So a very small frontal prism develops with 95% of it going down the trench. And let's look at sediment accretion versus subduction erosion. The threshold for growth of an accretionary prism is about one kilometer of sediment in the trench. In settings where an accretionary prism develops, we have an accretion of some of the sediment scraped off the downgoing plate, subduction still of some sediments, and a minor component of tectonic erosion. In settings where we have subduction erosion, very little sediment is accreted. The vast majority of sediment goes down the trench. And we also have a significant component of tectonic erosion of the overriding plate. Subduction erosion is the detachment of rock and sediment from the upper plate and the transport of this material toward the mantle with the under thrusting lower plate. So it is this material that's being carried down by the underthrusting lower plate. The evidence that's most commonly cited for subduction erosion includes deeply subsided and down tilted convergent margin. So subsidence on the outer part of the forearc, coastal exposure of Mesozoic or early tertiary arc plutons, which makes me think first of the Peru-Chile trench, and a progressive landward migration of the magmatic arc over tens of millions of years. So in the case of Chile, there are granites right on the coast, and the active arc is inland from the coast. So pretty archetypal subduction erosion system. So the subsidence of the outer forearc, so in the Japan forearc, we see subsidence of the outer forearc of about four to six kilometers during the last 15 to 30 million years.
you can see that here, the results of this seismic profile, where we see the downgoing Pacific plate on those reflectors, the frontal prism, and the backstop of basement. The late Oligocene shoreline is now submerged about five kilometers. This is the late Cretaceous basement. This gives us an erosion rate of 50 cubic kilometers per million year per kilometer for arc, and a truncation rate or an advancement rate of three to three and a half kilometers per million year. More evidence of this subsidence of the outer fore arc can be seen in the Peru Trench, where along this profile they found shelf facies bivalves and rounded cobbles near the Peru Trench. In the Andes, as I mentioned, we see those older granites along the coastline and a progression of plutons toward the active, the modern active arc. So you see the present day Chile, Peru trench migrated. So the Peru Chile trench migrated over time landward. And Western South America has been tectonically erased or eroded by subduction in the past 200 million years. That's 4,500 cubic kilometers per kilometer of margin removed in 145 million years. And that gives an advancement rate of the arc of one to two kilometers per million years. Is a rarity of Archean rocks shown here in blue in the cratons a function of slow production of continental crust or is it perhaps a function of rapid subduction erosion? After all, we see a large percentage of convergent margit systems that have non accretionary forearcs in pink. The long-term rates of continental and island arc truncation that's caused by subduction erosion is at most 75% of ocean margin subduction zones, where we see trenches migrating or advancing on average 2.5 kilometers per year, an average of all of these systems. That corresponds to migration of the subducting slab, as well as the arc. I'm going to estimate crustal losses at ocean margin subduction zones, where we have a large frontal prism that comprises about 20% of ocean margin subduction zones. About 40% of the sediment is subducted, but it's unknown just how much crustal erosion is taking place. In small frontal prisms, those comprise about 53% of ocean margin subduction zones. We can estimate that about 100% of sediment is subducted and about 40 cubic kilometers per million year per kilometer of crustal erosion is taking place. Intermediate systems with medium-sized frontal prisms make up the remainder. The annual crustal losses at the global length of about 43 and a half thousand kilometers of ocean margin subduction zones is about 1.5 cubic kilometers per year from subduction erosion and about one cubic kilometer per year of sediment subduction totaling about two and a half cubic kilometers per year that's lost to the mantle. At a crustal recycling rate at subduction zones of two and a half cubic kilometers per year, 
during the past two and a half billion years, a volume of continental crust of about 70% of that existing has been recycled to the mantle. A volume of continental crust of about 0.4% of the mantle has been recycled to it. If we look at the growth of the volume of continental crust through time, there are several ideas. I won't go into great detail of these. Time and billions of years is on the x-axis, and the percentage of the growth of continental crust is on the y-axis. There is this Big Bang model of Dick Armstrong's back in the late 60s that said most of the continental crust grew prior to 4 billion years ago, and that it's been at a fairly steady state since then, or that we have a sort of punctuated growth of continental crust over time in dribbles and spurts. If we look at images of the subduction channel, we can see the top of the downgoing oceanic crust, a subduction channel that is perhaps a kilometer thick, this is in Japan in the Nankai margin. And we also see these mega lenses of margin wedge basement in transport toward the mantle, riding on the downgoing plate. The typical thickness and composition of material moving toward the mantle in the subduction channel at convergence rates of 70 plus kilometers per million year. The thickness of the subduction channel is about one kilometer, of which two thirds is eroded four arc material, and one third is subducted oceanic sediment. We look at a general model for subduction erosion We see a subsiding and extending forearc, a small frontal prism, oceanic sediment in green, the oceanic crust being broken up by normal faults, we see fractured mantle wedge, look at a close-up of this system. We see an increasing strength of the downgoing oceanic crust with the loss of fluids. A zone of hydrofracturing above it and fluids migrating through these fractures. And this fluid overpressure and normal faulting combine to remove material from the base of the shallow mantle wedge. Also notice the beginning of the seismogenic zone. The subduction of seamounts disrupts the accretionary prism. And here's an example of the Daiichi Kashima seamount in the Japan Trench, just about to enter the trench. Here are subducting seamounts in the Middle America Trench, where there's ongoing subduction erosion. And you see the tracks of the subducting seamounts here, and more seamounts on their way. The seamount subduction oversteepens the slope and increases sediment influx from the forearc to the trench, so adding sediment from the steep end fore arc. The conventional view of most of the material in a subduction channel is that it's recycled to the mantle. The material could be returned to the upper plate by crustal underplating. <clears throat> 
it has to be small because the exposed volume of high pressure and low temperature rocks is globally small. Material could be returned to the upper plate by arc magmatism. That's evidently small because more than 90% of this material is supplied by mantle peridotite. Or the material is recycled into the mantle. It was estimated to be at least 90% of the crustal materials transported in the subduction channel. That's the conventional view. Of course, there are many places where we see these high pressure, low temperature rocks and rocks that have traveled down the subduction channel that are returned to the surface. Here locally, we have blue schist at Ring Mountain that represent metamorphism of the subducting oceanic crust. Cherts in the Golden Gate National Recreation Area that are ocean floor sediments, siliceous sediments. And much of this material is brought up in a serpentinite melange where the serpentinite is acting as a slippery, hydrous, buoyant, weakened zone within the subduction channel that carries with it chunks of dense, high-pressure, low-temperature rocks like eclogite and blue schist, as well as other material that's subducted into the channel. This diagram shows two situations where we have um, ocean, ocean continent collision and continent continent collision. And really, we're just closing a small ocean, and so this is a time evolution of a convergent margin. You could use the Himalaya as an example of this, where before about 57 million years ago, the Neotethys Ocean was subducting beneath Asia and bringing India along with it. And then at about 57 million years, India collided and transformed this convergent margin to a continent-continent collision. In subducting the oceanic crust, we have an accretionary wedge that's taken down to about 40 kilometers depth, a serpentinite channel that develops from serpentinized mantle resulting from the fluids that are released out of the dehydrating oceanic crust, and of course the metamorphism of the oceanic crust to amphibolite, blue schist, and eclogite facies. Much of this material can be carried back up the subduction channel as subduction is ongoing. And the serpentinite can be thought of like a buoyant blob of material that is less dense than the mantle that, that the subducting lithosphere and sediments are trying to be pushed down into. And so it wants to rise up out of the subduction channel and it'll bring along whatever hitchhikers and the pieces of subducted ocean crust or sediments or mantle that it can bring along with it. In a continent, continent collision zone, again it is pieces of continental crust that are exhumed again while collision is ongoing. We see that in the Himalaya where collision is still taking place and we have 53 million year old continental rocks that were metamorphosed at mantle depths and are sitting at the surface next to pillow basalts and serpentinites. And I'll say that these Continent, continent collision zones 
when those dense, high-pressure, low-temperature rocks, the eclogites and the blue schists, are brought back up the channel, they don't comprise a very large percentage of the total volume of rock that is exhumed. They're carried along within pieces of felsic gneisses or schists that are much less dense than the mantle. There's some evidence that we have of ultra high pressure metamorphism, and that is when rocks are subducted to above where we see quartz transformed to coesite or graphite transformed to diamond. And that takes place in at great depths at 90 kilometers plus in the mantle. And those rocks are returned to the surface by those mechanisms we just discussed. And we see the petrologic evidence in coesite that's rimmed by quartz here in a fractured garnet. And this rock is from the Dabishan in eastern China. This is a, a 20 micron inclusion. Or we see very small or microscopic diamonds in zircons. This one is from the Kochetov massif in Kazakhstan. So the presence of this coesite and diamond implies the return of the material from more than 90 or 120, 130 kilometers depth, whether you see coesite or whether you see diamond. And there are several places around the world where we've had these continent-continent collisions and have that petrologic evidence of ultra-high pressure metamorphism. That includes the Himalaya, Eastern China that I just mentioned, the Dabishan, the Kochetov Massif, uh, East Greenland, and also Nor Norway that were once part of the same system, uh, the Italian and French Alps, and elsewhere. So small amounts of these high pressure or ultra high pressure rocks reach the surface, but suppose a density filter traps them in the lower crust. And this was proposed and may be a little heretical um, by Hacker in 2011, who suggested that one cubic kilometer per year of silicic material is recovered and that implies a felsic lower crust compared to a crust that is mafic in its lower reaches. And this could take place with this model of relamination where continental crust is subducted and underplates the overriding plate. And this is going to result from density contrast that we have between upper continental crust and the mantle that you're trying to subduct it into. My PhD advisor always described this like trying to flush a ping pong ball down the toilet. It just doesn't want to go. So we've looked at the arc magmatic crustal structure before, but what's the composition and what volume of these rocks do we have in the magmatic arcs? If we look at crustal growth rates and millions of years since subduction began, We see a four arc spreading phase, true subduction beginning, and then stabilizing after about 40 million years. The growth rates range from 20 to 40 cubic kilometers per million year per kilometer of crust. 
to 165 cubic kilometers per million years per kilometer. Looking at the velocity structure of these island arcs, we can use the Aleutian arc as an example. Velocity is shown at the bottom, depth on the y-axis. The Aleutian arc is much faster crust than average continental crust here. And we can compare many different arcs and see that those arcs are all faster and thus denser than continental crust. So the continental crustal velocities here represent andesite and the velocities for these arcs represents basalt. So this gets into the andesite paradox. How can we form an andesitic continental crust when most mantle-derived magmas are basaltic? Most velocity models for continental crust composition show a granitic upper crust, an intermediate or andesitic middle crust, and a mafic lower crust. The first solution for this andesite paradox could be that arcs are unimportant. Uh, continents grew early in Earth's history by other mechanisms, whereby the vast majority of the crust is produced before we have modern island arcs in the last billion years. But most models still produce 25 to 40 percent of crust at arcs. Solution number two could be that arcs aren't really basaltic. The relamination produces a garnet-bearing felsic lower crust that has seismic p-velocities that are similar to gabbro, so similar to a mafic lower crust. This is a new idea and untested, but it's potentially a com confounding idea. Solution number three could be that arcs aren't all the same. Some arcs produce crust that chemically and geophysically resembles the continents. So, for example, we looked at the Izubonin middle crust that has p velocities that are characteristic of the continents with compositionally intermediate plutons and velocities that are also intermediate. But petrologic models require crustal cumulate volume to be about the seismic lower crust volume as the petrologic counterpart to intermediate middle crust. But where is it? Solution number four invokes delamination whereby the lower crustal root eclogitizes, becomes gravitationally unstable, and sinks into the mantle. So garnet growth at low temperatures and high pressures leads to a density instability. It becomes denser than the underlying mantle. At temperatures that are greater than 700 degrees Celsius, a Rayleigh-Taylor drip forms on timescales of about 10 million years. That is, continuously during arc evolution. So arc gabbronorites and other gabbros can have densities that exceed the generic pyrolite model for mantle rocks. This problem is close to home because where is the route to the Sierra Nevada? We have the Moho in black and it's lacking the crustal root beneath it. This could be that it's eclogitized and looks like mantle seismically, or that it's delaminated. 
there's seismic evidence for active delamination of an eclogitic root. We see the moho here and a hole in crustal reflections. This could represent one of these drips, a mechanism for delamination of lower crustal rocks. This would happen in this kind of sequence. About 18 million years ago, there could be a brief resumption of normal subduction with Miocene volcanism and serpentinization of the mantle wedge. 16 to 10 million years ago, subduction ended and a slab window infilled. Inflow of a stenosphere started a drip 10 to 3 million years ago. And finally, downwelling of the drip. And this can take with it slices of lower crust. We can also look at Cascadia as another example where we see a pronounced moho beneath the arc, the downgoing basaltic crust that becomes eclogitized, and where's the delamination in this setting? The biggest earthquakes occur in subduction zones at depths of 20 to 30 kilometers, so relatively shallow. And the seismogenic zone exists because of friction between the two plates. The geotherm controls the deepest point of brittle failure. This depth plus the slab dip control the down dip length of the seismogenic zone and the largest potential earthquake. Larger earthquakes are associated with higher convergent rates and continental arcs. With thicker crust, there's a longer seismogenic zone down dip. In this diagram, we have magnitudes of the largest earthquakes in the diagonal lines, with the biggest earthquakes happening in these Andean type subduction zones as opposed to rifted arcs and intraoceanic subduction zones. This seismogenic zone would look something like this with stable slip happening near the top, a locked section between the two plates below that, a, an, a region of slow transient slip and high fluid pressure between about 20 and 40 kilometers, in this region where the largest earthquakes are generated. And that's over about a hundred kilometer length. And that's over a, about a hundred kilometer distance, followed by stable slip at deeper depths. The earthquake cycle involves an interseismic period where strain is building up for decades or centuries along this locked segment of the subduction zone. There is uplift of the overriding plate and shortening in the overriding plate. Then the co-seismic period involves a release of strain in just a few minutes, where we see areas of uplift and of subsidence. And notice the coastline here. In the magnitude 9 earthquake that produced the tsunami the day after Christmas in 2004, off the west coast of northern Sumatra, we saw evidence of this process. We see Banda Aceh before the earthquake in satellite imagery. And after the earthquake, this is what it looked like. This is not tsunami damage, but rather the tectonic subsidence.